Bologna, 1858. A Jewish boy is kidnapped by the Inquisition. His father takes up a struggle begun by Napoleon 60 years earlier. The Emperor nearly succeeds in dismantling the Inquisition and securing its secret files. But the Popes regain their earthly powers. Decades later, a desperate father will fight to get back his son. The boy becomes a symbol for an embattled Pope. The Jewish father and the Emperor unleash the forces that bring about the end of the Inquisition. In the spring of 1940, at a Belgian abbey, an aged monk reflects on a lifetime. He can almost hear German troops marching at the border. 88 years old, Father Pio Maria is one of the last critical figures of the Inquisition. The devout father's early life had been the center of a firestorm of controversy in the 19th century. The Nazis will soon begin rounding up all those tainted with Jewish blood. Pio Maria thinks back to the time more than 80 years earlier, when he was born to a Jewish family in Bologna, in what was then the Papal States. Edgardo is the child of Mariana and Momolo Mortara, a middle-class family with an upholstery shop. The Mortaras are among the 200 Jews who live in Bologna illegally. It has been almost 300 years since the Jews of Bologna were banished from the city by the Catholic Church and ordered never to return. The Jews who inhabit Bologna live in fear of the Pope's deputy, the Inquisitor of Bologna. When I talk about the Mortara case, I often hear it said, but the Inquisition was back in the 1500s or maybe the 1400s in Spain or 1600s, but how could there have been an Inquisition in the second half of the 19th century? And people also at the same time don't realize that where the Pope had power, as he did in Rome in, up to 1870, the Jews are confined to ghettos. In the middle of the 19th century, Italian Jews are forced to live in cramped ghettos, forbidden to associate with any Christians, to own property, to attend university, or to travel freely. They are even required to attend sermons urging them to convert. These laws are enforced by the Holy Office of the Inquisition. The Italy we know today doesn't exist in 1858. The North is dominated by Austria, the South ruled by Spain. Across the middle of the Italian peninsula, the Pope rules as King of the Papal States. The existence of the Papal State was one reason why the Popes opposed Italian nationalism. It raises for the first time the possibility of one unified Italy. Thank you. 
Bologna has always posed a threat to the power of Rome. In 1858, Bologna is a hotbed of political dissent, where covert groups of revolutionaries aim to overthrow the Pope King and create a unified Italy. June 24, 1858, a search is underway. But the papal police are not looking for revolutionaries. They are looking for a little Jewish boy named Edgardo Mortara. of this evening represent a desperate last attempt at exerting the power of the Inquisition, an institution Napoleon and others had tried to abolish more than six decades previously. June 1796, outside the city of Ferrara, French General Napoleon Bonaparte and his army have successfully swept across northern Italy, capturing city after city in the name of France. He brings the spirit of dissent, revolt and enlightenment to Italy. When he learns of the restrictions on the Jews, Napoleon immediately issues an edict, ordering the gates of the ghettos demolished. Old laws demanding Jews to identify themselves with yellow bonnets are abolished. The Jews are now free to live anywhere and to practice their religion openly. The Jews, now full citizens, revere Napoleon as a great liberator and create a special prayer in his honor. The Jews of the Papal States are no longer subject to persecution for the time being. From Napoleon's perspective, the Inquisition represented all that was wrong with the Ancien Regime, with the old regime, the old political forces. The papacy was a product of the Middle Ages, Napoleon believed, and in particular, the Inquisition, which embodied the power of religion over the state, from his perspective, was something that no modern state, and certainly no state that he led, would tolerate. Madrid, 1796. Spain is repressed and terrorized by the Inquisition. Napoleon will find a surprising ally here. Deep inside the apparatus of the Spanish Inquisition, a priest, opposed to the Inquisition's brutal regime, spends late hours examining the church's most secret documents. Father Juan Antonio Llorente scrutinizes thousands of documents of secret confessions, trials, and executions materials covering more than 300 years of the Spanish Inquisition. My firm conviction that the Inquisition was vicious in principle, in its constitution and in the laws, induced me to collect every document I could procure, to give the world a true code of the secret laws of the Inquisition, which were veiled by mystery from all mankind. But it would be far too dangerous for him to share these opinions and openly criticize the church and its methods. Even more so since Father Juan Antonio Llorente is Secretary General of the Madrid Inquisition. For his views, Llorente could be brought to trial himself. Instead, he bides his time, seeking the opportunity to reveal to the world the horrors locked in the archives. We are all, most of us, products now of hugely diverse pluralistic societies. And the notion that a particular religious belief would be essential for the functioning of the society seems to us quite foreign. It's extraordinarily difficult for us to grasp. June 24th, 1858. The papal police knock at the door of the Jewish family of Momolo and Mariana Mortara in the central part of Bologna. 
Marshal of the Papal Carabinieri informs the Mortaras that they are the victims of a betrayal. Their accuser is not named. Producing a list of family members, he demands custody of their son, Edgardo. His orders are to take the boy. A papal law has been broken, and the Jewish boy has now become property of the church. Powerless, his parents can do nothing more than watch. Edgardo's sister, Ernesta, will be scarred for life. The abduction of Edgardo Mortara not only shatters a family, it will help trigger the collapse of church powers and bring more than 600 years of brutal inquisitions to a halt. One of my great grandmothers, Ernesta Mortara, was his sister. I've heard a lot of stories about her and other members of the Mortara family, including the fact that when she was older, she was often having nightmares about uh, the police coming into the house to, to take the child. Twenty-four hours have passed since young Edgardo Mortara was ripped from his parents' arms by the papal police. All they have left of Edgardo is the receipt signed by the marshal. No one knows where the child was taken. No one can be sure if they will ever see Edgardo again. To Momolo Mortara, only one thing is certain. His son was abducted by order of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. The order was issued because, in the eyes of the church, the boy is no longer Jewish. He has been secretly baptized and is now deemed a Christian. The parents are amazed, horrified. They say, we're a Jewish family. We don't even let our child go to, into a church. We don't let our child set eyes on a priest. He, of course, hasn't been baptized. For Momolo Mortara, nothing is quite clear. Who claimed to have baptized his boy? When had the act taken place? With what intent? How could it even be proven that the baptism had happened at all? I was struck as if by a bolt of lightning. Surely there must have been some misunderstanding, some mistake behind it all. Not knowing what to do, Momolo Martara works up the nerve to confront the one man capable of shedding light on the mystery. Father Pier Gaetano Filetti, the man responsible for ordering the abduction of Edgardo, charged by the Congregation of the Holy Office in Rome with combating heresy and defending the faith. Father Filetti is the chief inquisitor of Bologna. Every inquisitor in Bologna has lived and worked in these quarters since the first in 1273. And one day he hears a report that a child in the Jewish family of the Mortaras has been in the past sometimes secretly baptized because it's the position of the Inquisition that any baptized Jewish child be seized from their Jewish family. He orders an investigation. Sì, non posso fare niente per te. 
Father Folletti refuses to tell Momolo where the boy is being kept. For the church, freeing Edgardo Mortara is simply not an option. More importantly for the Mortaras, the Inquisitor refuses to share the information in Edgardo's file. Evidence that might give Momolo a clue to locating his son. The files of the Inquisition are not accessible to this Jewish father or anyone else. The secret files of the Inquisition had been Napoleon's obsession 50 years earlier. Spain, 1808. Napoleon's armies occupy Madrid, depose the former rulers, and install his brother as king. After 330 years of violent rule, the French waste no time in abolishing the Inquisition in Spain. A Polish colonel attached to Napoleon's army attacks the offices of the Madrid Inquisition, seizes its files, and liberates the unfortunate inmates of its prison. From the diary of Colonel Vladislav Lemanowski. We found living sufferers of both sexes and of every age, from three score years and ten down to fourteen or fifteen, and all in chains. Here we found old men and aged women who had been shut up for many years. We then proceeded to explore another room. Here we found the instruments of torture of every kind which only the ingenuity of men or devils could invent. These images of the horrors of the Inquisition are the work of Francisco de Goya, considered one of the greatest artists in the history of Spain. The French occupation ends the Spanish Inquisition. Goya is now free to portray the terror of the Inquisition in this famous series of drawings. Fantasy, abandoned by reason, produces impossible monsters. The Inquisition is a brutal and absurd organization, which its efforts to quell civil disobedience has now created obstacles to a freer society. Goya is not the only one now free to express himself. With the backing of Napoleon Bonaparte, Juan Antonio Llorente digs deeper into the files of the Spanish Inquisition and publishes its horrors to the world. Llorente's research leads him to the startling discovery that of nearly 85,000 accused of heresy between 1547 and 1699, more than 12,000, or 15%, were burned at the stake. For the church, already standing on shaky ground, these revelations are nothing short of devastating. For compiling the first history of the Inquisition and giving its victims a voice, Canon Juan Antonio Llorente is awarded the Order of Spain by Joseph Bonaparte. Fifty years later, the Jewish father from Bologna sets out to expose the iniquities of the Inquisition. June 30th, 1858, six days after the abduction of his son Edgardo, Momolo Mortara makes a startling discovery of his own. A neighbor reveals that a carriage was spotted carrying Edgardo and his captors.
It was seen speeding out of the city. Their son is no longer in Bologna. He has been taken to Rome, a journey of six days by carriage. The Inquisitor refuses to tell the Mortaras on what basis he's taking the children. In other words, who is it who claims to have baptized their child? They say their child was never baptized, but they can't prove it unless they find out who it is who is supposed to have baptized him. Trying to determine who could have baptized Edgardo, suspicion turns to a former nursemaid. Anna Morrissey, an illiterate Catholic woman who seven years earlier had been employed as a servant by the Mortaras. Anna Morrissey recounts that she indeed had baptized young Edgardo because he had been sick and she had feared that the boy might die. As a good Christian, she had tried to save his soul. She came up with a bit of water and baptized him by sprinkling, pronouncing the sacramental formula. The boy had not died, and she had thought nothing more of it. Years later, she told another servant about the incident, and soon the rumor of the secret baptism reached the Inquisitor. A fearful Anna is summoned to the offices of Father Folletti. The Holy Inquisitor interrogated me about what I had done with Edgardo, forcing me to tell him everything. I dared do it because even if they had surprised me, they would have just found me with a glass of water in my hand. And they probably wouldn't have understood what I was doing. There's actually a big drama here in terms of, was this boy actually ever baptized? Ana Marisi has been working for years as a servant in Bologna to make enough money so she can have a dowry to return to the rural town she came from in order to marry, settle down, have her own family. She hasn't been able to make that amount of money, but she does hear that the church is giving money to needy, deserving Christian girls for dowry. Who is the person in Bologna in charge of giving those funds? Well, it happens. It's Father Folletti, the Inquisitor. And the Inquisitor made me swear on the crucifix to say nothing. He told me that I acted excellently in baptizing the boy. Because that way, if he died, he'd go to heaven. Anna Morrissey agrees to repeat her account in the presence of witnesses. But while Momolo has gone to find a notary, Anna slips away and leaves town. Well, in the first months after Edgardo is taken, his father is ceaseless in his activities to gather the material that he's convinced will get the Pope to agree to return his son to him. So that he wants, first of all, to show that his son had not been baptized and does all he can to get evidence that Anna Morisi, the servant who says she has baptized him, was lying. The taking of Jewish children by the church is a common occurrence in 19th century Italy. But for Momolo, a clandestine baptism can't be an acceptable answer to the abduction of his son. Momolo Mortara prepares his own formal request to free Edgardo. He writes to the Inquisitor, Father Gaetano Felletti, pleading for his son's release. He also writes to the Secretary of State of the Holy See and to the Pope himself, Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono. Interestingly, he remained at this time 
convinced that if the Pope only knew the full story, the Pope in his goodness would allow his son to come back to his parents. It is inconceivable for me that a child can be taken away like this. Surely there must be some misunderstanding, some mistake behind it all. In response to his desperate plea, the Pope grants Momolo a rare privilege, permission to visit his son in Rome at the House of Catacumens, a secret church institution where young Jewish girls and boys are regularly cleansed of their names, their identities, and their religion. Napoleon had been the foremost opponent of the church's power over citizens' lives. In 1809, he abolished all political powers of the papacy and crowned himself emperor. Then he ordered the entire Vatican archive sent to Paris and directed his archivists to search for evidence damning the church. Eighteen ten, Napoleon's dream of humiliating the church is well underway. Over the steep trails and deep gorges of the Italian Alps, convoys leave for Paris, weighed down with the pillaged archives of the Vatican. In all, the convoys carry more than 3,000 crates crammed with Inquisition trials, sentences, decrees, correspondence, and doctrinal pronouncements. Enough detailed evidence in the eyes of Napoleon Bonaparte to turn the conquered people of Italy away from the church and the corruption of the papacy. For those transporting the prized documents, the difficult terrain is fraught with peril and valuable evidence is lost along the way. Two wagon loads are lost at Borgo San Donino, near Parma. Eight cases disappear into a canal between Turin and Susa. Despite these setbacks, a total of 3,239 chests containing more than 100,000 volumes arrive in Paris. Among many extraordinary discoveries, Pierre-Claude Donou, Napoleon's archivist, uncovers files describing the absurdity of the trial of Galileo. In a letter found in the stolen files of the Inquisition, Galileo sends the church and its members a stern warning. If anyone maintain that the opinion that the earth moves is heresy, and if afterward demonstration and observation would prove that it does move, into what embarrassment he would have brought himself and the Holy Church. It is precisely this embarrassment with which Napoleon hopes to undermine the papacy, but the return of the old order in Europe will intervene. Since Jews are not allowed to fix their eyes on the House of Catacumens, much less knock on its door and expect to be admitted, Momolo's visit must have had an unimaginable impact. Still, the father's attitude is righteous. I am in the firm belief that justice will be done to me. Trusting that I have been heard, I raise my prayers to the highest authority that my hopes are not in vain. With its origins in the third century, the House of the Catacumens has but one goal, to convert Jews and Muslims to Catholicism. To make conversion more likely, friends and family members are refused access. The emotions of family contact can easily sabotage the conversion of an unbeliever. What happens at this encounter is a matter of dispute. According to the Mortaras, young Edgardo pleads to return to his family. But both father and son are intimidated by the intensity of their surroundings and the religious officials who hold all the power.
Although Momolo has now freed him to see him and to talk to him, the boy is never left alone with his father. But many decades later, Edgardo has a different recollection. Needless to say, they tried every means to get me back. Caresses, tears, pleas, and promises. Despite all this, I never showed the slightest desire to return to my family. A fact which I do not understand myself, except by looking at the power of supernatural grace. Throughout the meetings, officials of the catacumbans offer Momolo a simple solution to his problem. Convert, and you will again be able to be with your son. Under the Inquisition and in the Papal States where the Inquisition was being fully enforced, you couldn't agree to be baptized and then become Jews again. It was not an option just to go through the ritual, which to them might have been an empty ritual of baptism, and then continue to be Jews. Uh, then the full force of the Inquisition would have come down on their heads. Momolo's encounter with his son in the House of the Catacumans is used for propaganda by Catholic newspapers. As they reported it, on Edgardo's journey to Rome, a miraculous conversion occurred. The boy is said to have declared, I am baptized, and my father is the Pope. According to the Catholic press, Edgardo Mortara's father is now Pius IX. Many years later, Edgardo testifies about the Pope. He always showed me the most fatherly demonstration of affection, wise and very useful lessons. And blessing me tenderly, he often told me that I had cost him much pain and tears. Hounded by the forces of change sweeping across Europe, the Pope sees the Mortara case as an opportunity to assert the power of an ailing church. But the Pope is in for the fight of his life. The Mortara case comes as almost manna from heaven for the forces for unification, because they are able to use it to argue that there needs to be separation of church and state, that the Pope should not have a police force, should not have his own army, that this is a vestige of medieval times, that modern times, the times of the Enlightenment, no longer allow this. The greatest champion of the separation of church and state had been Napoleon. But in 1814, Napoleon is defeated in France itself, and his occupying armies are forced to leave Spain. After Napoleon's defeat, the laws permitting equality, liberty, and fraternity are retracted in many countries. In May of 1814, in Spain, a royal proclamation states that anyone who supported the French during their occupation will be executed. The King of Spain vows that every heretic will have his tongue bored through with a red-hot iron. The dark days of the Inquisition return with a vengeance. March 16, 1815, Francisco de Goya is dragged before the Inquisition and accused of obscenity charges for painting a naked woman. Goya himself is forced to wear the cloak of shame at his trial. He is also accused of collaborating with the French. He escapes both charges through the mercy of the king. Goya escapes to Bordeaux in France, where he continues to paint until his death in 1828. His friend Llorente also flees to France, where in 1818, he publishes his greatest work on the Inquisition. In Italy, a new pope returns as the head of the Papal States and the Roman Catholic Church. He orders that the archives stolen by Napoleon be returned to Rome. But the French are unwilling to pay for more than one quarter of the transportation costs. To reduce delivery costs, some Inquisition files deemed unimportant are left behind in Paris and sold to cardboard makers and fishmongers. In all, nearly two-thirds of the materials originally stolen by Napoleon are deemed expendable and are sold. Some even fall into the hands of French bankers who blackmail the church into buying them back at exorbitant prices. Worse, for the Jews of Italy, 
they are herded back into the ghettos and again forced to wear the yellow bonnet. In the Papal States, the Inquisition will endure for another four decades. Romolo Mortara writes to anyone who can possibly help to get back his son, including politicians and Jewish leaders in England and America. Through the new electronic media, the campaign draws the attention of newspapers in the world's democracies. In the month of December 1858 alone, the New York Times publishes more than 20 articles on the case. Momolo was quite an admirable person, a person with a lot of uh, personal courage. He was able to transform a private case of suffering into a, into a public problem, really. One of the most powerful and influential men called on to support the return of the boy to his parents is the Jewish banker to the church, James de Rothschild. He writes to the Pope. I am certain that this fact can only be an abuse of power or a miscalculated excess of zeal, since Your Eminence's reputation for justice is, for me, a guarantee that a procedure such as this, which has thrown an entire family into despair, would not be tolerated. In fact, uh, the Pope himself, Pius IX, has been dependent on loans from the Rothschild banking family to keep the Papal States afloat, which is one of the great ironies of this story. Yet even in the face of requests from his own financier, Pius IX refuses to budge. But although they tried, the Pope says this is a matter of deep principle, of deep Catholic principle on which I ca cannot bend. Both the powerful and the powerless tried to steal this boy from me and accused me of being barbarous and pitiless. They cried for his parents but they fail to recognize that I, too, am his father. I had the right and duty to do what I did for this boy. And if it were necessary, I would do it again. Pope Pius IX stands fast, but even he cannot stop the larger forces at work. The Mortara case comes at a crucial time in history, for European history and also for Italian history and the history of the Catholic Church. It comes at a time when the Risorgimento, the movement to unify Italy, is gaining steam. It's a movement to create what there hadn't previously been, a single Italian state. For almost half a century, revolutionaries had dreamed of a unified Italy. That dream had finally arrived. After protecting the Papal States for 250 years, the Austrian army is forced to withdraw from Italy and leaves Pope Pius IX's regime vulnerable to attack. Father Folletti, the inquisitor responsible for the kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara, is arrested in the middle of the night by the former Papal police, who now work for the new civilian government. They demand the Inquisition's secret files in the Mortara case, but Folletti refuses to hand them over. The Inquisitor is brought to trial on kidnapping charges, but that doesn't get Edgardo back. Well, the tables had been turned, and this there was nothing maybe more uh, as a dramatic illustration of this than the fact that the Inquisitor could be arrested and charged with a crime when all he had done was obey the orders of the Pope. And of course, this was his defense. In 1861, all that is left of the Pope's temporal kingdom is Rome and the area immediately around it. Throughout the peninsula, a new secular kingdom of Italy has been proclaimed. For the Pope, the collapse of the Papal States is but another trial sent by God. But this time, no help will come. In 1870, the Italian army reduces Pius IX's kingdom to the Vatican buildings. For his refusal to bend in the face of change, 
the last bastion of orthodoxy comes down. Pius IX has lost his entire earthly kingdom. He writes to Edgardo. I acquired you for Jesus Christ at a high price. So it is. I paid dearly for your ransom. No one showed any concern for me, father of all the faithful. Pius IX is the first pope to be photographed and the last to set foot outside the Vatican for the next 59 years. The pope resigns himself to his own ghetto, a swath of land a mere hundred acres. September 20th, 1870 is a historic date in Italian history. It is the day when the Italian army would break through the walls of Rome, the last part of Italy ruled by the Pope. The Pope would retreat to the buildings of the Vatican and Rome would become the capital of the new Italian state. Mumola Mortara had been waiting for 12 years for this to happen. With the end of papal rule and the Inquisition, Momolo Mortara is now free to bring his son home. Twelve years have passed since his abduction. Edgardo learns that his father has come to Rome to take him back. His reaction is unexpected. From the letters of Edgardo Mortara. On October 22nd, 1870, at 10 at night, accompanied by one of the friars, both of us dressed in street clothes, we made our way to the central train station where, my mentor told me, he spotted my father. Deeply frightened, I begged in my heart that I be spared the encounter. And in fact, my prayer was answered. And without any incident, I got on the train for Bologna. In the battle for the soul of Edgardo Mortara, the church emerges victorious. After 12 years of fighting for his son, Momolo Mortara is forced to return to his family empty-handed. Never would he hold Edgardo again. He spent much of his uh, life after the, the case in, in trying to, to, to move public opinion, and uh, I think that needed a lot of uh, courage and also of uh, a sense of uh, um, civic responsibility. So I think Momolo is a person who's uh, well worth remembering. Only a few letters will be exchanged in which Edgardo tries to convince his parents of the truth of the Catholic Church. At the age of 21, Pio Edgardo Mortara is ordained a priest and dedicates his life to spreading the faith. He will spend his last years in quiet contemplation and prayer in a Belgian abbey. For 1,000 years, papal power struggled to preserve the Catholic Church as the world's only true religion. Through rigid doctrine enforced by the powers of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, the church has reigned supreme. Now that reign has come to an end, its powers rendered impotent by the forces of a changing world. <laughs> 